I might want to explain, first of all, where are you? You've got some people, we've got some people here from out of town. Uh, you are on the ASU downtown campus. This is something we thought of in about 2005. Made a case to the city council and the mayor at that time, Phil Gordon. Said, you know, ASU ought to be in the city. Uh, a bond election was passed March of that year that brought nearly a quarter million dollars to a state university from a city by virtue of a two to one vote of the taxpayers here. So we have almost 13,000 students in downtown Phoenix, including in buildings like this one. This is uh, the Center for Law and Society, and it's also the home of the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. So we're delighted to have you here. Like the rest of the campus, we've tried to make uh, our buildings as porous as they can be so that they uh, connect to the city, and it's a perfect uh, way to kick off this conference. So um, again, a lot of you are from out of town. We appreciate the fact that you made the time to be here. Um, I'd like to thank, uh, if you haven't already met them, an extraordinary staff who's helped you to get, there, get here, worked on your hotel rooms, your flights, and everything else. So uh, hopefully they will come forward. You have met them. But Sabina Butler, uh, assistant who works in my office, has been responsible for just about everything that's happened here. Jamie Hogue, uh, to my left here, who's worked on all of the panels. Cece Revere, who's out at the front desk. Uh, ben Stanley, who has helped with a lot of the logistics with regard to research behind the panels. Melissa McCann, uh, who uh, is somewhere here. I know she was on an airline uh, flight today showing people the Colorado River. Colorado Liver, that would be interesting. The Colorado <laughs> River. And uh, last but not least, uh, Kate Carefoot in the front row, who uh, is with our office as well. She has been working on this project diligently for about the past eight months. So if you could give a round of applause to people who made this happen. So how did 10X come to be? Uh, just a short personal history. I spent 10 years of my life in the New Orleans area. Uh, when I did my graduate work, it was on what would happen in New Orleans when the hurricane hit, because it hits every year. It's just a matter of degree. Uh, when I came here in 2003 as the dean of the College of Design, I was in yet another city where people were asking, why does it even exist? When it was in New Orleans, why are you living below sea level? When it's here, where does the water come from? How does that work? It turns out, if you make the observation that I did, both these cities are on the I-10. And upon further investigation, it looks like all the major issues of our time are uniquely distributed in this corridor. Think about what's in the news right now. Uh, in Ciudad Juarez and El Paso, immigration, uh, obviously a top of mind. Think about the transition we're going to have to make from fossil fuels, which is going to impact the city of Houston, also on the 10, the energy capital of the world. Think about global trade, which is in the news right now, and tariffs, and 50% of the goods that come into this country through the ports of Los Angeles, not to mention uh, New Orleans, Houston, Jacksonville, Baton Rouge. So there really isn't a topic of major import that isn't arrayed across the tent. And water, of course, is foremost among them. So we thought that we would turn this into a project that's more than about water, and it's more than about events. Um, and so we started with water, however, because of the existential nature uh, of what it means to all of us and the fact that clearly there's too much on one side of this equation where you're seeing sea level rise and inundation in the Gulf area and not enough out here. And so we held our first 10X Water Summit in Baton Rouge last year, thanks to my good friends in the front row, John Davies of the Baton Rouge Area Foundation and his peers are here and they staged a magnificent event and so we thought the next one obviously ought to be here in Phoenix, where we would see the other side of that water equation. And then we'll go to Houston, to Los Angeles, and then we'll probably return back to the Gulf. So that's how these water summits started. We'll do some others on other topics. But I want to conclude by saying uh, three things uh, about uh, where we're going. We see water not like most water conferences would talk about water. We see water as a major indicator of how we're going to handle these big issues. Secondly, we're more than about events. We want to engage in some projects. And lastly, we think like 10 across itself, 2,400 miles from coast to coast, we need to be thinking bigger, literally, in terms of geography, but certainly bigger in terms of the issues. And so with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to my good friend, uh, who I've met through this whole process, John Ross, who's going to speak to you about the map that you've been carrying around that was created by John Wesley Powell, who clearly suggested to us 
that we needed to think about this country and other things in a different way with a different lens. And the reason that you have it on a card is that if we had a major screen hanging here and projecting it, at, uh, in a case of wind gusts came through here, we might lose a $100,000 screen. So we decided that, not was a, that was not a good idea. So you have it in your hand and uh, you can take that away. So with that, I'm gonna turn over to John Ross to tell us a little bit about Powell and the importance of that map. And then my good friend, Sarah Porter, is gonna moderate a panel speaking about water in the West. So John. Thanks, Duke. Everybody hear me okay? So if you don't know John Wesley Powell, you should. He was, uh, in many respects, I argue in my book, uh, uh, more influential than most American presidents. What we know about him, most famously, of course, is his famous trip down the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon when that was the last bit of unexplored territory. And they went down in four small wooden rowboats, 10 men. They knew less about what they were gonna find than Neil Armstrong knew when he went off to, to the moon. They had quite a harrowing time. Six came out, it's, a, it's an incredible story. Uh, six came out, they lost a boat, they almost lost their lives, they came out starving, and Powell came out a changed man. But what's most interesting about Powell, certainly with regard to what we're talking about here today, is what happened later in his life. He went on a course to found the US Geological Survey, do all sorts of things on that front, become a real centerpiece of federal science. But what he started to do uh, with visualizing the American West for America was extraordinary. And I'll just take a second to talk about it because that gets to this map which is an extraordinary document, one of the most incredible documents, I think, in American history, map-wise, certainly. He had spent his time out in the West surveying. He climbed, uh, was the first to climb Long's Peak. He had a real understanding of the American West. And after the American Civil War, people had put down their, uh, their rifles and started looking west to develop. And what was that gonna be about? Their eyes were blinded by manifest destiny, these incredible ideas of great wealth and extraordinary, and yet in this unvisualized American West. Powell stepped in and said, hang on a second, we've got to think about how we do that. That was not well received. He turned out in front of the National Academy of Sciences, and he had taken a map of the continental United States, and he drew a map, a longitudinal map, are close to the 100th meridian. And you'll see that on this map right here. On the eastern line, you'll see this little uh, orange line. And this was an incredibly simple but profound line in the sand that he drew. And what was it? It was an isohyate, which is a rain line. 20, he had taken all the data, the 20 inches of rain line, and everything generally to the east gets 20 inches or more annually of rain. Everything to the west generally gets 20 inches or less of rain annually. What, why is that figure significant? Well, it's what you need for conventional agriculture without irrigation. What he was saying in one fell swoop with this line on the map was that we could not go ahead as business as usual. What was business as usual was 160 acres homesteads you know, that were given to people who could homestead. 160 acres, you could, you know, work the land, it was yours. Jeffersonian, this is bedrock, fundamental America, and the yeoman farmers making America great. That wasn't gonna work, he said. Whoa. Now, he said also that this wasn't just a matter of being that the West was dry. He kept going. And he said, again on this map, which is extraordinary, it looks like somebody's taken a paintball and hit the continental American, uh, the West. These are watersheds. And he said that unless we start thinking about water as a resource, if we don't start thinking about taking water out of watersheds, and we start thinking about local control over water, if we don't stop paying, start paying attention to monopolies, if we start thinking about, he had an idea about com watershed commonwealths. 
if we don't start thinking this, he started putting a framework together. He didn't have all the answers, certainly. He was very idealistic, too. But he believed that if we don't start thinking about this and water, that things were going to get rough. Litigation, you name it, was going to happen. And one thing, this, this one-armed uh, major from the Civil War, he lost his forearm, at, was amputated at uh, the Battle of Shiloh in the Civil War. One thing he knew for certain was that the union that he had bled for was worth fighting for. And finally, what he was speaking about with this map and with the countless talks he gave before he was shot down was that our democracy depended on us living in uh, understanding what the earth was telling us, what the land was telling us, what the water was telling us. These were the first real movements of environmental sustainability. He was not an environmentalist, but he talked about sustainability in new ways. And what his genius was, and what you can do, and you can still see this from space, this incredibly imaginative man. He would have loved PowerPoints, I can tell you that. <laughs> Twitter, I don't know, but uh, PowerPoints, he would have loved that. He could visualize, and what he did, and why this, this map and what you're holding is such a stunning, beautiful kind of uh, understanding of, of water and, and, and what the whole, uh, you know, what his whole vision was. And as I mentioned, he did get shut down, as we know. That's an incredible story, too. Manifest Destiny, folks, railroads, they didn't want to hear that. They thought he was standing in the way of progress. And he was saying till he was blue in the face, no, I'm not standing in the way of progress. This is the way toward progress. But, and I'll end here, he gave us a blueprint, a way of talking about these issues, though then they fell largely on deaf ears. So again, anyway, uh, an incredible story. All right, yes, it's on. Thank you so much, John. Um, the book, I'm, I'm not finished, I'm ashamed to say, but I am really, really Thank enjoying you. this book. It's wonderful and I commend it to everyone. I believe it'll be available in the a conference bookstore tomorrow. I'm getting a nod and I, I urge you all to make sure to pick up a copy. You, you will, you, the fact that you're here guarantees that you'll love the book. Um, I'm just going to take a couple minutes to lay a little bit of groundwork on the topic of the evening, which is really the drought contingency plan or the DCP. Um, the, those of us who are uh, so fortunate as to live in the Colorado watershed have been really steeped in the DCP, and uh, you'll get to learn more about it tonight. But let me give you a very high level overview. So we're talking about the Colorado watershed, one big watershed. Um, I was hoping that maybe from this map we could, we could kind of see it, but let, let me just say as a native of Arizona, almost the entire state of Arizona lies in the Colorado watershed and only little bits and pieces of the other basin states are in the Colorado <laughs> River <laughs> watershed. Um, bits but the pieces, bits and pieces, <laughs> it's Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, a little tiny bit of New Mexico, uh, very small amount of California, and, and then uh, Mexico. Uh, so it's seven states in Mexico, the Colorado River, which was once named or called the Nile of the West. It was seen as this very important water resource for the American West. Um, it now uh, supplies water to some 40 million people, 22 Native American tribes. It irrigates about four and a half million acres of agriculture land. Um, it is the place of um, amazing biodiversity, critical habitats, iconic parks and monuments, including uh, the, the Grand Canyon. Um, in 1922, the water brains of those seven states said, we should think of the Colorado watershed as two. There's an upper basin and a lower basin. This is not so much hydrological as political. Uh, the upper basin states realized it would be a lot smarter to band together and kind of throw Arizona to the big wolf of California, but they were going to stick together and leave Nevada, which was really almost nothing at that point, 1922. Bugsy Malone hadn't visited yet, um, that they would leave Arizona and Nevada to California. So they divided it into two basins. And over time, two big reservoirs have been developed on this system. Um, there are many reservoirs, I think a total of 20-something 20, 20 reservoirs or dams on the whole Colorado River. But the two big ones 
our Lake uh, Powell, which is up at Lee's Ferry, which is in Arizona, mind you. And then there's um, Lake Mead, which is the lower reservoir, which uh, sort of touches Las Vegas and Arizona. Um, so the drought contingency plan is about addressing the fact that these reservoirs are threatened by, lower, by declines, by declining levels. Um, why are they threatened? Well, famously, the Colorado River is over allocated. Uh, it is, it was, the water was allocated at a hydrologically wet time, and so there was an overestimation of how much water would be available to be taken out of the river. Um, also because it took decades for the, all the people who have rights on the Colorado River to make use of their rights. And so there was extra water in the system for a very long time. And also because we are in our 19th, well, maybe this year it won't be our 19th, maybe we will have ended the drought. We're, we're, I haven't heard any official proclamation of the end of the drought, but we've been in 19 years of drought on the Colorado River. Um, and some uh, climatologists believe that the whole watershed is aridifying. It's getting drier. So the DCP is all about how do we manage with less water in the Colorado River. Just as in 1922, we decided we'll have an upper and a lower. We have an upper basin drought contingency plan and a lower basin drought contingency plan. Working, those two DCPs come together and they're very important to keep the system operable. And what does it mean the system stays operable? Uh, it means that, that both reservoirs can still produce power. It means that the d levels don't get so low that we get to Deadpool where no water can flow out of the, syst the system. So James Eklund here uh, is, uh, very, has been very um, integrally involved in DCP negotiations in the upper basin as well as the whole basin. And Dave Roberts here has been very similarly involved in DCP negotiations on the lower basin um, as well as the entire basin. The upper basin DCP is really aimed at keeping levels of Lake Powell up. And James will talk more about it, but basically, the way I see it is the two big things that the upper basin DCP does is it allows releases from upstream reservoirs that wouldn't have happened otherwise in order to keep the, the levels up if needed to keep Lake Powell operable. And it also, and this is the most important thing, it enables the banking of water in Lake Powell as a conservation measure to keep the levels up. You can bank water in Powell with the upper basin DCP. Similarly, the lower basin DCP, which is focused on keeping the levels of Lake Mead up, I, I think of as two big parts. One is voluntary cuts, mostly taken by Arizona, um, for the reason that in order to get the financing for the big project that moves a huge amount of Arizona's Colorado River allocation to the Phoenix to, and Tucson areas, um, the Arizona agreed that that part of the allocation would have junior priority to everyone else. So Arizona's head was on the proverbial chopping block there. And the other big part of the lower basin DCP, as with the upper basin, is accounting rules that will enable water users to conserve water in, in uh, Lake Mead. So a lot of DCP is complex accounting rules that will enable water to be kept in Lake Mead. Why? Because without those rules, if, you know, without DCP, if a water user leaves water in Lake Mead, that water is really available for a lower priority user. So you need these ground rules. Um, the only other thing that I would add, and I'm, thank you for being so patient about my high level summary of DCP, I know th these guys are both cringing, um, <laughs> is that the, the DCP is one step in a process. Uh, from, from my perspective, the first, I mean, the Colorado Compact was 1922, and there has been all kinds of litigation and agreement from that point, many, many different settlements and agreements and lawsuits. But in 2007, the seven states in Mexico agreed to the first big um, agreement to share in potential shortages. Again, in 2007, Arizona agreed to take the lion's shares of the cuts. But those 2007 guidelines were an important moment in the Colorado River Compact and relationships. And then, uh, so the DCP is the next step in sort of coming to terms with the fact that the 2007 guidelines wouldn't be sufficient. And we know that the 2019 DCP also is not the solution. So the seven states in Mexico are engaged in ongoing negotiations which are meant to conclude in a new agreement for the operation of the Colorado River 
and it is due in 2026. So we have barely, barely enough time to get to agreement. All right, well, thank you. Um, there will be a time after some initial discussion for questions from you all. And by the way, we can't see you. We see just a lot of very bright light. Um, but I want to start by asking James to, to just um, tell us, what is your connection with the DCP? And in your mind, what does it mean for the upper basin and for the whole watershed? That's really three questions. Thank you. Uh, well. <laughs> Thank you for uh, in having me uh, here. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm James Eklund. I'm from the state of Colorado. I represent uh, the Colorado uh, governor and the rest of the state, for that matter, on Colorado River negotiations uh, on the seven state, uh, the seven states that were mentioned. And then uh, also in the upper basin, we have something called an upper Colorado River commission. And I'm the commissioner for the state on that body. Um, it's great to be here. This is the coolest lecture hall I think I've ever seen. Uh, it's really making me regret. I went to a different Pac-12 school, and, and this is, uh, this is uh, really rubbing my nose in it. Uh, but uh, the, the drought contingency planning, let me just start with that phrase, drought contingency plan. There's a, a great friend of mine and a water uh, expert uh, named Will Sarney at this conference. If you haven't met him, you will. And Will is uh, fond of saying, you know, drought is not what we're experiencing. And I couldn't agree more with him on this. We're experiencing, you know, the effects of climate change, and we're if we're experiencing uh, low hydrology. But if you say drought, then hope is a strategy. And so, uh, and nobody wants that to be our plan. It can't be, uh, or you and, and the governor of Colorado, the governor of Arizona, uh, would find other people to do these jobs if that was our plan. So uh, we got to do better than that. And uh, the drought contingency plan, really when we, we saw the effects of the 2002-2003 uh, drought uh, that was pretty, pretty rough on the system, uh, and and we, we basically said, hey, Bureau of Reclamation, go, and that's the federal agency that administers water and kind of runs and operates the reservoirs in the West. Uh, we said, go model the, the reservoirs, these two massive, the largest reservoirs in North America, man-made reservoirs in North America, Lake Powell and Lake Mead, model those and assume that the last, you know, 10-year period of record is the next 10 year period of record and tell us what happens. So the Bureau went back and ran the models and it wasn't good. <laughs> they said, these reservoirs are compromised if uh, we keep going the direction that we're headed. And so we said, well, well we've got to have some sort of contingency plan because uh, right now we have none. Right now we administer and operate the reservoirs uh, according to the 2007 guidelines that were mentioned and those are effective till 2026. And so that's the, that's the ball game. So if the rules have changed, so to speak, uh, and we've got new uh, facts that we've got to work with, then what's that look like? And um, uh, that was really the genesis of the contingency planning effort. And uh, the lower basin has done theirs. That'll be talked about. Uh, they started up the conversations around what they could do, tools they could deploy to keep mead uh, sustainable and healthy. And we had to do the same thing for Lake Powell. So the two tools we stood up, uh, or stood up in, in the discussions were, uh, first, there are reservoirs on your map that uh, are not demarcated on here. They, they came along after. Uh, but but uh, there are three big buckets, so to speak, up above Lake Powell. The Flaming Gorge unit between Utah and Wyoming, and then you've got the Aspinall unit, which is near Gunnison in Colorado, if you know where that is, and then the uh, Navajo Reservoir, which is on the border between New Mexico and Colorado. Those three buckets feed into Lake Powell, and we said if we operate those in a strategic way, there might be a way to influence the levels of Lake Powell such that in a 
in a crisis, and we're really talking about, you know, we're hurtling toward the, sorry for all the metaphors, I have a metaphor, I can torture a metaphor better than anybody, but if it's, if you're falling out of the airplane at, you know, 500 miles an hour, and you got to look to your shoulder, and there's got to be something to pull so that you can slow your rate of uh, descent. And uh, that's really what the contingency plans are designed to be, is our, our ripcord pulling moment. We've got to have a chute, and it better be, have, have been packed really well. And uh, that's, that's what we're looking at. So we can reoperate those, re we can operate those reservoirs that sit up above PAL in a way that's strategic. And we looked at the models. That didn't get us all the way home. So we had to look at what types of conservation measures could we deploy to uh, put water into PAL that otherwise would have been consumed by us in the upper basin. And that's called, you know, that's a $5 phrase for using less water called demand management. And demand management is the other tool that we have uh, tried to stand up in the, in the upper basin. So uh, I think I've rattled on long enough about the upper basin drought contingency plan, but I'm happy to keep going if, uh, if, <laughs> if you guys want. I think you've made the point that it's very important. Yeah, it's very <laughs> important. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. All right. <laughs> Excellent. You've also, um, I think, done a great job of communicating that these issues are complex. So good on you there, James. Thank you. Thanks. And so let me turn to the lower basin. Um, Dave, uh, you were involved with the lower basin DCP. Uh, what, what does it mean? What is it and what does it mean for the lower basin? And you feel free to sure. speak about your own connection. Sure. Um, thank you. And uh, appreciate being here uh, very much. Um, I know I'm a fill-in for Governor Lewis, uh, but I will give you a perspective uh, on the lower basin a drought contingency plan as well. First of all, just uh, let you know that I, uh, I work for a company called Salt River Project, and for those of you who are from out of state, uh, we're the largest uh, water provider and the largest electric company utility here in the Phoenix metropolitan area. So uh, we deliver on average every year about 800,000 acre feet of water to the Phoenix metropolitan area, and I hope you understand what an acre foot is. It's about 325,000 gallons. So just multiply that out, and that'll give you a perspective of how much water we deliver. And, and we deliver that throughout the valley. We have 660,000 water shareholders who benefit from that water supply, as well as a lot of contracts with others in the, in the Phoenix area, and over a million electric customers as well. And so we have all kinds of generation facilities that we operate as well. So. Um, Salt River Project uh, and I was invited to participate in the drought contingency plan planning work and really the, the steering committee that was developed by the governor to help us work through all of the issues that we would need to work through over the, over the time to, to really come to agreement in Arizona on a, uh, agreement to sign the DCP. Um, and a lot of it stems from relationships that Salt River Project has. We don't, we don't have an allocation of Colorado River water, but many of our customers and, and people that we do business with have allocations of Colorado River water. And we also do a lot of business with the Central Arizona Project. We have a, a long-term uh, collaborative operational relationship with the Central Arizona Project. Um, Central Arizona, uh, Sarah mentioned the, the, the big ditch that brings water, the junior priority water user. It is the Central Arizona Project, which has uh, basically scoops up all the unused water in Arizona's 2.8 million acre foot allocation, and they have typically on average between 1.5 and 1.7 million acre feet. So they deliver actually almost twice as much water when, when we have a good year as well. Okay. So throughout the, the uh, their three, they, they have a much larger service area than ours as well. So. So we were asked to participate because of our long-term relationship with a lot of the customers who would be impacted here. Um, and because of our long-term relationship with the, Reclam the, the Bureau of Reclamation. We, we operate a reclamation project just like the Central Arizona project is as well. And so those relationships have been a big key to uh, our involvement in the DCP. And, and you know, when you go and you look at the situation facing the lower basin, um, and the, the issue was just taking more water out of Lake Mead than what was coming in from Lake Powell and the upper basin. I mean, that was the, that was the issue. And, and the Bureau of Reclamation kept allowing us to take the full amount of water every single year. And eventually, as we looked at the hydrology that James talked about, that was not going to be sustainable going forward, even with the interim guidelines that we had 
put in place back in 2007. So we had to come up with something that was going to be um, a little bit more strenuous and a little bit more difficult relative to keeping water in, in, in Lake Mead. And since Arizona has the larger part of the, the junior supply, although there are some junior supplies in California as well, um, it was going to be a big hit on central Arizona, and particularly the water supplies for central Arizona agriculture, some of the Indian tribes, some of the, the municipalities well here in the Phoenix area. And so we, we spent two or three years working with the lower basin states and Mexico on trying to figure out how we might allocate actually reducing our diversions out of Lake Mead. And so how, you do, how would you allocate that reduction? And we're very grateful that, that we actually worked out something that Mexico is going to take a little bit less water, California is going to take a little bit less water, and Nevada is going to take a little bit less water. They didn't have to do that, but that just comes from a lot of those relationships and collaboration working together because they also realized how that impacts the entire Southwest as well. So um, we were able to come together on that and, and get agreement on it. Uh, we take the Central Arizona Project takes the biggest hit. And, and our issue was, in order to sign on to the drought contingency plan, we needed the, the legislature to approve that the governor could sign off on this. And that, you know, when you're dealing with water in Arizona and the politics of things, it's a very, very stressful time. So uh, we were able to get through that with a great leadership from uh, the governor, great leadership from our state Department of Water Resources director, Tom Bushansky, the Central Arizona Project. They stepped up big time from a financial standpoint and a water supply standpoint. And um, while we still have a ways to go um, in getting this federal legislation done, and hopefully that will be done over the next couple of weeks here, um, that we can then move forward and, and implement the DCP. And what's interesting is about implementing the DCP, now that the upper basin is getting a little bit more on the snowpack, it'll be interesting to see how that implementation goes. Because we were planning for certain levels of cuts, and those may not materialize next year. So. It'll be interesting, so I'll, I'll quit there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Well, let's turn to, to David Festa from EDF. You had a, a, an op-ed in The Hill this week, which I recommend to everyone. It was uh, March 23rd in The Hill, saying Congress passed the DCP legislation. And you say in that op-ed, this agreement war marks a watershed moment in building our country's resilience to climate change. The DCP embodies two key principles of building resilience collaboration, and trade-offs. That, um, that applies not only in the West, but across our country. So maybe you could riff on that a little bit, David. Sure, yeah. Well, you know, um, I, I hope it's coming across to you guys that the DCP is a big freaking deal. Uh, <laughs> and, and EDF has been working on water for 40 years. So we've seen, you know, we've seen a lot. Um, and I would say that there's sort of three characteristics about the DCP, and, and frankly, I think it characterizes sort of where we are on water in the West in general. This could be a very, very productive time. There's three, three key components, um, and they almost are very Powellian. Um, but the first is bottom-up visioning, the second is bridging the urban-rural divide, and the third is getting groundwater right. Now, the catalyst is extreme weather, which we've heard about, but if that's all there was, I'd be pessimistic. Because without a vision for the future, all extremes do is create chaos. Um, so here's the catch. Coming up with vision uh, for the future is going to require trade-offs. And we've got to move these decisions about those trade-offs away from state capitals, even Washington, D.C., and back down to the regional and local levels. That's a lot of work, but to see what, uh, see what can happen, you only need to cast your gaze eastward on I-10 towards Louisiana. Um, nearly a decade ago, uh, my colleagues and I were told by state officials that they'd get booted out if they imposed from Baton Rouge the requirements or the trade-offs required to meet the, the twin challenges there of sea level rise and, and uh, land loss in the Delta. And you know what? They were probably right. So um, as a, a way of trying to provide a little bit of a fresh start, to some of those dialogues, one of the things that we did with our, our allies is launch a design competition called Changing Course. And the vision that, that came bottom up from the stakeholders was one of a smaller, more sustainable delta. There were big trade-offs in that vision, but the stakeholders believed that that vision would safeguard everyone's economic and cultural values. Now, don't get me wrong, Changing Course is no silver bullet. 
and the civic leaders, some of whom were here today, showed great grit and courage and determination in negotiating a complex maze of science and competing interests. But the outcome, the outcome is really inspiring. The state's 50-year master plan has a realistic vision and won strong bipartisan support in the, in the legislature. So let me move a second to the urban rural. The dynamic is simple. Uh, urban areas have people and money. Rural areas have food, water, and wildlife. So what we want to do at EDF is reconnect urban and rural areas so that we can optimize how water is used. I often get asked why Environmental Defense Fund is so positive about agriculture. Well, um, the answer is simple. Abandoned lands are as bad for the environment as they are for rural communities. We need working lands to be working, but they don't all have to be working to grow food exclusively. Some of them can be used for flood management or fire management, wildlife management, and particularly to strengthen water security during droughts or periods of extended hydrological anomaly. Um, <laughs> that said, um, we can no more expect farmers and ranchers um, to deliver those benefits than we can ask them to feed us for free. They have to get paid. And this is where the drought contingency plan really came in. Um, it's an example of these principles in action. Uh, for instance, the tribes, particularly the Colorado River Indian tribes and the Gila River Indian community, um, really stepped up. I wish Governor Lewis was here. Yes. I would thank him mm -hmm. directly. But among other things, they're participating in some of the agreements that you heard uh, talked about here, system conservation agreements to keep water in Lake Mead. And I'm very proud of the fact that Environmental Defense Fund is the first environmental uh, NGO to join these agreements. So last but not least is groundwater. Now, I see groundwater as kind of a master variable in building resilience. And that's because if we prioritize its ability to act as a safety net, aquifers can provide a, a critical buffering function that's essential to all of our well-beings in, era, uh, in an era of extreme weather. Um, so in California, we're working with agriculture and agencies to rebalance the water equation there and comply with the state's ground, uh, landmark Groundwater Management Act. Now as an aside, I'll say that that act is an example of getting it right when it comes to that uh, bottom up, top down. The law sets common objectives but leaves it to the regions, to the local basins to decide how to meet those objectives. Along Colorado's front range, we're rolling up our sleeves, as James knows, to um, help design transactions that make sure cities have water without putting farmers out of business in the process. And finally, here in Arizona, we're supporting legislation that creates stakeholder committees in two counties to recommend, to come up with um, locally driven recommendations on groundwater solutions. And also under the DCP, we're looking forward to working with stakeholders, uh, many of them right here on the stage, uh, to improve upon the 1980 Groundwater Management Act. We need to ensure that um, we don't overdraft groundwater as a way to deal with the reduced Colorado River supplies. So I think that's, uh, I'm gonna stop my summary there and, and, and hand it back to you. Thank you. So John, David talked about all these local solutions and, and trying to kind of get DC out of the, out of the picture. I wonder, do, does that, um, have an echo of what John Wesley Powell uh, would have wanted, and do you, is there any way that maybe the West is kind of coming around? Do you have any sense of that the West is kind of coming around to what John Wesley Powell had in mind for how water would be managed in the West? You know? <laughs> a loaded question, but uh, <laughs> it's interesting when you read about this federal bureaucrat, you know, who uh, was, pivotal in establishing the Bureau of Reclamation. I mean, he died in 1902, so he didn't uh, see how it all turned out. Uh, he was adamant, I mean, read this stuff, and um, adamant about keeping water in local hands. And he said at one point, you know, feds keep your hands off in capitals, um, with exclamation points, which he didn't usually use. And uh, he was adamant that, that it had to once after federal work had done, and he was not against damming and some things and all sorts of management on that level with reservoirs and things like that. But once those were taken care of, he really felt that the whole key was to get it back on the local level. So I do see some examples of that happening now. Um, would he be happy? I don't know. <laughs> he, he also foresaw decades of 
litigation and piling up, uh, what did he say, piling up a legacy of litigation? Yes, or, yeah, yeah. yeah. A great quote about that, yeah, you know, yeah. that we were just going to dig ourselves in to terrible, terrible problems. And of course, 30 years after he died, we got the Dust Bowl. Mm -hmm. So these less lessons come very, very hard. And uh, I think that um, with, I, he would be on the forefront, I have no doubt, uh, on global climate change mm -hmm. today. And Columbia uh, uh, University meteorologists did a study uh, reports the last couple of years, um, two of them last year, excuse me, uh, and looked at Powell's line, that line you have on your map, and it saw that if, and looked and said, is, is this still a viable concept? And they said, and they found that it was. Mm -hmm. And they looked at it again, too, and they looked at data from 1980, and they found, and this is still very controversial, but that the actual, the 100th Meridian line has moved east 140 miles. Mm -hmm. So there is creeping aridity mm -hmm. going on right now. So let me ask James and Dave, um, the, I mean, I think we particularly experienced in Arizona that the DCP was pretty political. Um, it was probably political all throughout the Colorado Basin. Does politics get in the way of the important science? And how do we make sure that the science is part of the discussion and the decision making? Start with it's such an easy question, James. <laughs> yeah, it's sure a no brainer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we have a, a, a great, uh, wise uh, su former Supreme Court justice in Colorado named Greg Hobbs, who's done a lot of bit of a, a bit of writing and poetry on water in the West. Uh, he's actually quite prolific, and and he is. Uh, fond of saying that, uh, I think he was quoting a Supreme Court justice, a U.S. Supreme Court justice, uh, when he said it, and I can't remember which one, but he said, uh, when the law stops following science and uh, the will of the people, then the law is an ass. <laughs> and so uh, what he meant by that was, I think, pretty obvious that, you know, if there's a disconnect between our policy, our laws, and what we're actually observing, and living through and living with, uh, then that disconnect is going to uh, lead to some, some really misguided policy. And uh, we, can, we can do better than that. Uh, so, you know, politics is absolutely, we're in an American democracy. Um, the Republic, uh, it, it requires, it's not just that water or energy or immigration, whatever the issue happens to be, Th those are creatures of politics. They have to be political. And it's our job as participants in that democracy to make sure that the, we get it right and that we don't turn a blind eye to science. Uh, so it's encouraging to see the broad coalition, you get EDF and, and uh, water managers around the West uh, all coming together and saying, we need a better plan than the one we have right now. And that is a science-based approach that recognizes the reality that we're living with. Uh, so I would say they're inextricably interlinked, and uh, we, it's up to us to make sure that uh, our policy reflects what we're, seeing, what we're observing. You want to add to that? I, I would, uh, really, there's not much to add there. I mean, I think James has hit it, uh, the nail on the head there with respect to not being able to divest those two. I would also say that the, that the laws that have been developed in the West relative to the allocation and the appropriation of water have also led to a lot of discussion about how the politics fit into the overall supply and, and, and the demand for the water supply and also how, the, how science fits into that entire equation as well. And so we need to work within the context of the laws that have been established. A lot of um, uh, investment has been made on those based on uh, the allocation of the water based on those laws and then to work through, through in a collaborative way much like we have done on the Colorado River system over the last 20 years into solving those challenges and and educating folks about especially the the politicians about where where the uh, the science fits in and how it overlays with the water supply and how it overlays with the laws that allocate that water supply so I'd sum it up by saying uh, politics isn't the problem. Politics is just public discourse, but ideology uh, yeah, yeah. is what gets in the way. It's deeper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, related to that, uh, 
I know that in some places, I won't name names, talking about water by itself is a, a very touchy subject. Um, we wouldn't want to have messages that convey that that our places are not good places to come and live and do business. We, that's the last message we want to convey, and yet we want to be able to have honest conversations that get us to solutions. Um, David, you must have seen this in other places, not only in the American Southwest. How do we have those conversations, and how do we change the conversation to get us to solutions? What's your sense of that? Well, darn it, um, this is where my, my, uh, the soundbite you asked me to say yeah. for the end is perfect. Well, we can. <laughs> so I'm going to use it now yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah, it's so good. You can have another soundbite then. Yeah. Uh, look, I mean, I, I, I think, I think um, water is like money. Mm -hmm. No one ever thinks they have enough, but if you manage it well, you can have a good quality of life. And so I think that is the, that's the key way to approach communicating about any of the resources that we have on, on which we have to live on a budget. And by the way, it's almost all of our resources, whether it's if you live in Louisiana, it's your shoreline. Here, mm -hmm. it's water. The upper Midwest, it's soil health. These are all, all assets that we have a budget for. And we can blow through that budget and be in a world of hurt, or we can manage that budget and have, have, have economic growth, have great quality of life. So I think it's always coming back to, it's not about, I really, I, I just really object to the whole framing around scarcity of almost anything. Because it isn't really scarcity, it's just a budget. It's just a budget, that's all. So that does mean we have to make some tough choices to manage that budget, but when we do that, we're gonna be fine. And I think the DCP is a great example of that. Dave, you're nodding the budget. Does that work for you? And how yes, and that, that's the way that we have been at Salt River Project for many, many years, living within that budget. Uh, sometimes we get a surface water supply off the watershed that that becomes our primary allocation of water for that year in the budget. Sometimes we don't, and we have to draw upon those groundwater resources. And so you have to be able to, to, to know that. Now, the other aspect of it is how do you increase the size of the revenue that comes into that budget? To be in, where, where do you augment water supplies for that? for that particular area as well. And that's another area that I think when we go post 2027, that, that augmentation of the Colorado River system is going to be on the agenda as well, so. Wow. You agree, James, you're nodding. Uh, yeah, do you I mean, talk about a budget in Colorado, water budget? Well, it's, it's different. You know, the, the dichotomy of this basin, if you're not from it, is, is really interesting. You've got the upper basin, that really relies on the, the snowpack is our largest reservoir. And if you don't get a good snowpack, we've got, we're blessed with one this year, but if you don't get one, then you have a shortage every year in your, in your system. Um, down here, you live below the largest two reservoirs in the country, so you're gonna get your water. Uh, I may think you use too much. You probably <laughs> don't think you use enough. Uh, but I, I think that, um, you know, it, sitting next to a historian, I, it, maybe it's the it's the the same air we're breathing or something. But it it seems like uh, it's it's appropriate to to quote Lincoln and you know, a house divided cannot stand. And that's really what the drought contingency plans are exemplified to me. And that is that idea that we can all have different views and different perspectives, different value sets even, but we are one basin that has to rely on this one resource. And if we divide into our, you know, we balkanize this basin into our discrete uh, components, we will, uh, we will have a very hard time. We'll, we'll be in court. Um, in the upper basin, just to be clear, Sarah, we have not litigated on the Colorado River. Congratulations. I awesome. just want to say awesome. that. Uh, I, I mean, you, didn't, you didn't have to share your water with California. Be what you say. <laughs> John, it, it occurs to me that this whole messaging thing was the fundamental problem for uh, John Wesley Powell. He, he went back to Washington and he just didn't strike the right note. Uh, I think what we're seeing here, I mean, when I hear about the issues we're talking about today, it resonates so much with what he was dealing with uh, back then, and I think this is what, on a very, very large scale, and what Powell can really help us think about holistically on a very large level, is we're really talking about changing a lot of our ideas about American identity. Mm -hmm. Talking about budgeting, you're talking about water. These are things that uh, the 
normal American doesn't really kind of understand. But really what it is about, if you raise it back and back and back, and this is what we all in this room have to work on, is talking about all of this, educating people, is really a whole shift in the way that we look at our resources. Mm -hmm. um, there was always going to be, there was fake science in his day. There was a theory called rain follows mm -hmm. the plow. Um, which was this theory that if you broke the ground uh, that with a plow, the rain would come. And uh, there was always going to be these things which are going to unsettle, uh, confuse kind of the talk about what the science is and what we are actually dealing with. But underlying that is really, really talking about, you know, uh, <laughs> being good neighbors, uh, sharing, balancing, doing all this. And this gets into countering such things as this perpetual feeling of, that Americans have on one hand, which is really wonderful, our optimism. The downside of that optimism is we think that there's always going to be some technological uh, you know, thing down the, down, the, down the line that's going to save us, that we're going to pull a rabbit out of our hat. And uh, that's increasingly not clear that that's <laughs> something that will happen. So these are the things we have to be also talking about as we're educating people towards thinking about. Do we have time for a couple questions? Yeah, and, and I, what I wanted to clarify, uh, uh, Dave brought it up. Uh, Governor Lewis of the Healy oh, right. Indian Tribe was going to be on this panel, and we're sorry he's not because I think it's a, a viewpoint that we wanted to make sure that you heard. Unfortunately, he got called to Washington for the very thing you're hearing about. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wanted to make that clear. And secondly, uh, I, I referred earlier to the Ten Across Water Summit 1 in Baton Rouge. And the reason that this has started to work is that all the issues that you're hearing up here about how we're going to cooperate, how we're going to understand policy, how we're going to work the feds, et cetera, applies to those who are experiencing inundation, like they are in Louisiana. And, and what we found is even though our, the conditions of the West and the Gulf couldn't be more different, it turns out they're a lot more similar than we thought. And it was through dialogue we began to find these partnerships and ways of exchanging information, which is why we even have this whole project. There are a lot of water experts in this room, some of whom I'm sure has some thoughts, and those of you from somewhere else may have some questions, but we want to take just a few, knowing that it's late for those of you who've come from uh, other time zones. But uh, those of you who would like to ask a question or make a comment, and Grady, I'm looking at you a little bit, because I know you have <laughs> thoughts about how to perceive water in the West. If you want to say something. Well, so I'm curious. Um, here's, a, here's a box in which you can speak. Uh, <laughs> a the box. ASU box. Wow, cool. Um, so I'm curious, those of us who have been following this know that IID is kind of the last piece to fall into place. The IID is the Imperial Irrigation District. They are the largest single right holder on the Colorado River. Uh, they farm in Southern California. What's the deal? Um, why have they not agreed? When are they going to agree? Is, is the Salton Sea really the only agenda there? Um, and, and where is that going to fall into place? And how big a problem is it? And this is really odd, this box. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is. Dave, you can well, I'll, you I'll take a shot, and James, sea? you can jump yeah. in as well. Yeah. Um, yes, IID has, has not signed on to the DCP. Uh, they were going to contribute, they were going to share in some of the shortages that California would have taken under the DCP to the tune of around 250,000 acre feet when, it, when and if Lake Mead ever dropped to a uh, much lower level than it is today. Um, there's another large uh, entity in Southern California called the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California which has an allocation of Colorado River water as well. And they, um, they have decided that they would take the shortage that IID would have taken. And had IID taken the shortage, there would have been less water that would have been flowing into the Salton Sea. And the Salton Sea issue is that lake is, that, that, that man-made, or that, that lake that came about because of the Colorado River jumped its, uh, its, its, its banks back in the early 1900s, that lake was shrinking. And it was allowing the, uh, the, the lake bed to be uh, exposed and a lot of winds and a lot of dust and a lot of asthma issues in Southern California. And that, quite frankly, may be even coming into Arizona for all I know. But the, the fact of the matter is that, that IID wasn't going to sign on to it, but MWD has agreed to step in. And so the DCP is not really going to affect the water supply that goes into 
uh, salt and sea. And so um, I think those issues have been resolved among the, at least the seven basin states. And IID is free to join the DCP at a later date. Uh, they're working through some of those issues right now back in, in, in Washington, D.C., uh, to make sure and, and assure uh, those who are interested in the salt and sea and resolving the salt and sea issue are going to be taken care of at some point in the future. And that's, that's how I understand it, that's James. A really, that's a really good summary. Uh, I don't take issue. I agree with all of that. The, the issue, you know, just to add, is that if, if you have kids in an elementary school and they have higher rates of respiratory illness than uh, the neighboring town or other towns in your state, you're going to be concerned and you should, you know, it gets back to that representative democracy thing we were talking about. You should take uh, that very seriously and do something about it. And you know, the district should be commended and we are very empathetic as the other states uh, to their situation. That, that definitely needs to be addressed. Uh, they have asked for federal funds to be, uh, federal resources to be deployed, uh, and they feel like, this is one of the most impoverished parts of the country, they feel like if they move forward now, uh, they have, you know, the, the spotlight will move, and they will never get an opportunity to tell their story uh, to an audience of federal agencies that right now is very focused on what they have to say. So, you know, I, I, I think they're, they're doing what we would probably all do if we were put in that position, uh, but the DCP itself is, just as was said, uh, is, is not a, um, uh, a, a, a contributor to the problems at the Salton Sea. In fact, a healthier system is beneficial to everyone, including IID, and so we think it needs to move forward, but we, we also don't just want to leave that issue uh, and, and never come back to it again. We want to be there shoulder to shoulder with Imperial as they move forward in asking for the resources that they need. I know it's getting late, so uh, Paul? I guess this side of the auditorium gets the speaker tonight. Um, <laughs> You're allowed to throw that thing. That's why it's, I know. That's why it's in a <laughs> It's foam. a sponge ball, so you, you can throw it. You might have to throw it to that Sounds side when you're cool. done. So um, the negotiations that you all have been up by the name, by the way, my name's Paul Hurd. I'm at ASU in School of Sustainability. The negotiations you've been talking optimistically about, favorably about, um, currently the drought contingency plan, earlier the 2007 interim guidelines, shortage sharing agreement. Um, both of those were stimulated. Um, accomplished as a result of a, a widespread perception of a looming crisis. So both of them are kind of crisis management um, negotiations. And I'm wondering if you all are optimistic or pessimistic that we will get to the point where we can negotiate collaboratively without a crisis looming over our heads. Who would like to respond to that? <laughs> One of my favorite quotes is, supposed to have been by Winston Churchill who said that change happens in times of crisis right. and is made up of whatever plans are lying around at the time. Um, <laughs> so no, I don't think human behavior is going to change. Right. You know, yeah, I think we need to be motivated by crisis. But what we can do is be proactive about making sure there's some pretty darn good plans lying around. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd uh, tag on to that. You know, the further back you look, the further ahead you can see. That's a butchered yeah. Winston Churchill. <laughs> that's a uh, of, but, but that's, that, when I look at this map, that, that this really just uh, ahead of his time and uh, a genius really uh, that, uh, that you cover in your book, uh, when you look at this, you, you're re it really impresses upon you that the basins and the, the networks and the discussions that are driven in each of those basins um, and sub-basins is really where the change happens. And that's, that, that's where EDF is, that's where water managers are. It's really the boots on the ground that are gonna make this work or not and develop the plans that are going to see us through. Uh, and I just, I'm looking at this, I, I I uh, am I'm just impressed again, as always, when I see this map, uh, that somebody could wrap their arms around such a massive amount of the American West. And that's what we have, Duke, with this, this issue, with water in the West, is an opportunity to wrap our arms around something that m most people think is uh, 
unsolvable or for fighting only and, and do something that translates to other issues. I think I would take issue too with the characterization of the DCP, the negotiations for which started in 2007 and it concluded and maybe concluded in 2019 if the federal legislation is passed and everything holds together and it gets signed. But uh, and and yet, you know, the negotiations for the 2026 agreement have already really started. And so, um, I don't think crisis management is quite an accurate characterization. Um, something Dave has Dave has sort of said. Well, we're we, you can think of these as the phases. It's kind of incremental phases in coming to terms with what is the best scientific modeling for um, what we can expect from the Colorado River. And so the 2026 negotiations are going to be based on the best hydrology that we think we have and then kind of figuring out a way to make it work. I don't know how long the 2026 one is supposed to last, but yeah. it's not quite a, I want to just take issue, Paul, with crisis. Do we have another? So Jay, you want to close this out? Yeah. Can you catch this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice catch. I just, I just wanted to squeeze one of these Excellent. things. Uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks guys for uh, a, great, a great panel and, and so glad to hear words like uh, uh, collaboration uh, coming out of the, the discussion and the, and the deliberations, because it's true, if we don't work together, uh, we'll get nowhere. Um, that said, you know I love you, I know some of you, I think there's a little disconnect between what, you're, what you've been talking about and, and the reality of what's actually happening now. And so the Powell map is fantastic, and, and, right, and so it's been a great blueprint. Um, but there's another map, and there's a map of what's happening now, it's a map of the future. And I'll talk about that tomorrow. And it really points to the fact that there is chronic water scarcity. It's not a drought. We don't have enough water to go around, especially in the southwest, especially across the southwestern part of, of the I-10. And the evidence for that is clear. It's in the groundwater depletion that is so great, uh, especially in, in California, California and in the Ogallala Aquifer. Um, it's so great, you know, we're living well beyond our means. And so there is scarcity, we're living beyond our budget, and it's really driven by food production. So I think it's great that we've made progress, but groundwater can't really be looked at as a buffer. It's really part of, the, of our water security. It's part of our water supply. And we are not gonna make progress until we treat it as part of the budget. Right. Thank you. Anyone wanna comment? I, I would. Jay, um, say? Yeah, I think, you know, tomorrow you're going to hear from Catherine Sorensen, who's the Water Services Director for the City of Phoenix, and she'll talk to you all about, at least she's indicated to me, and I'm, I don't want to steal her thunder up there, she's probably <laughs> up there, but um, she'll talk about the sustainability of the City of Phoenix and how it's grown over the years, and she'll also probably talk about the groundwater code, which requires a 100-year assured water supply. So, you know, there is a carrying capacity for the, the, the Phoenix metropolitan area about just how much growth we can have. And that assured water supply requirement dictates what that capacity is. If we, if we don't have that supply for that 100 year period, you can't build a home, you can't grow. And so I think that will be the limiter within the city of Phoenix or within the Phoenix metropolitan area. And she'll talk, I'm sure, talk about those types of things. But I'm curious to hear, hear what you have to say uh, tomorrow as well. We're so. looking forward to it yeah. very much, Jay. I think well, we, have, we have one more person who wants question? to sneak in. Okay. Real question while we're over. I'm Gary, Gary with Senator Cinema's office. I'm wondering what long-term planning looks like post-2026. You know, we spend so much time on DCP. That's sort of a Band-Aid, and I'm wondering long-term uh, what everyone's vision for the future is on the river. Well, everybody has uh, their metaphors. I think of it less as a Band-Aid uh, and more of a bridge. Um, we, right now, if we didn't have uh, the contingency plans, we would be negotiating uh, really with the room on fire, and that's not a good place to, to do a deal. Uh, it, it usually doesn't lead to very uh, good policy. So what we've bought ourselves is a, a clean slate. Uh, we've put the fire in the room out, and we're sitting down calmly and hopefully wisely at a table, um, knowledgeable with the science that, that we, um, 
that we have. And in, in, in that regard, we've never been better positioned to have the discussion that will be, uh, you know, going off into some set time period. You know, the 07 guidelines functioned for for 20 years, so uh, until they didn't, <laughs> and we ended up having to have this contingency planning exercise. So I think what we would want to see is, you know, a, a, an effort starting in 2026 that allows for some of the increased variability in the system that we're seeing. Uh, we can't we can't lock ourselves into a narrow little box, or we'll be right back in this drought contingency planning, or um, by then it'll have some other name. Uh, we'll have some new product we'll have to cook up so that we can address the facts that we've been given. So it's a tall order, no doubt about it, but I think because of the DCPs, we are in a better position to have that conversation. Okay. Sarah, um, I, I would just add to that, um, and I made a brief reference in my, my comments. I think part of the future post-2026 is really rethinking um, the, the services that we're going to be paying farmers and ranchers for, for managing their land. It's not just going to be for food production. It's all the suite of what we call in the business ecosystem services, but that are vital for our, our ongoing well-being post-2026 in a world that will be continuing to warm even if we get to zero carbon by mid-century. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, uh, and I have a lot of passion around this, I'd be happy to talk with you more about it, but I think it's uh, really re-envisioning you know, what we're asking our farmers and ranchers to provide for us. Food, yes, but also these other benefits. Okay. So Sarah, I want to thank you and I want to thank the panel for all your observations. If you could uh, thank them, please.